We have with us, with us William Kovacic, who is the Global Competition Professor of Law and Policy and Director of the Competition Law Center at George Washington University Law School. Previously, he was a member of the Federal Trade Commission and he chaired the FTC from March 2008 to March 2009. He was also the FTC's General Counsel from 2001 to 2004. He has an undergraduate degree from Princeton and a law degree from Columbia, and he is going to be picking up uh, essentially picking up from where Jason Furman left off. And it's uh, 1215 now, we're gonna take him through the end of the day at 115. And uh, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. We will have his presentation and time for questions. Thank you very much, Chris, for the wonderful honor of participating in the, uh, in the workshop. And uh, if we can do as we did uh, through Jason's wonderful presentation, and I'm very grateful to him for uh, doing such a wonderful job of framing the way in which the system operates. If we could do the same thing as, as you field questions, let me know and we can, we can take them as we, as we go along. Uh, I want to, to pick up uh, where, where Jason finished, which is to look at where the system is going and to touch upon some of the questions that you had about what's going to be happening in the public policy arena, especially in legislation. Um, by way of a bit of context, uh, we are in the midst of quite an upheaval in the system. Uh, exactly what the outcome of that upheaval will be is hard to predict right now, but it is a period of upheaval. And we've seen this in the entire history of the system going back 130 years. Uh, what tends to, 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 to cause turmoil and debate, especially about the role of big firms? Uh, uh, several things come together. One is that you go through a period in which uh, antitrust enforcement is perceived to have been permissive. And the harshest critics of the US system today say that we have gone through a period since roughly 1980 when antitrust enforcement generally failed us badly by not being aggressive enough. The second is, as a result of this perceived permissiveness, uh, powerful enterprises emerge and dominate specific sectors and they do it in a visible way. Uh, and Jason has described how the big tech enterprises, for good or for bad, uh, have emerged and achieved that degree of, of salience in modern debate. The third is uh, the development of a literature that says markets are failing and public policy is failing alongside of it. And the two are closely related. And there's been a massive new literature in the last 20 months or so that seeks to document that phenomenon. And then the last is you need economic shocks that inspire a basic reassessment. And I'm going to suggest to you that the shock that set this in motion is the global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And I'm going to assert to you that that collapse, the near meltdown of the financial services sector, did two things. One, it create, created pervasive doubts about capitalism and about what on earth business managers were doing. How could they have turned the banking system into a casino? And the second is to discredit public policymakers who had tools and simply didn't use them effectively. And if you want a crystallization of that, I think the big short nails right on the head the convergence of those two concerns. And obviously it caused massive individual human misery. It put the economy on the ropes and in a sense we're still trying to come back from it. And it created a general sense that assumptions about the regularity, effectiveness of markets, and the soundness of light touch government intervention were all wrong. And it is in that environment that people are willing to think about the economy and regulation in a different light. That's happening right now. Uh, over the past uh, 18 months, there have been remarkable developments in this field. Um, four major lawsuits uh, involving, uh, three major lawsuits involving, involving Google. Um, I have FTC, Google, New York, Google here. That's my Google preoccupation, but of course, New York and the FTC have sued Facebook. And the District of Columbia at the beginning of this week brought a standalone case in the DC courts against, uh, against Amazon. And the private trial of Epic against Apple wrapped up uh, a week ago. Uh, with a decision there to be issued in, in mid-August. Mid These cases deal with exactly the kinds of claims of exclusion that Jason was talking about. The Google cases, essentially, to boil them down, 
argue that Google has paid for and demanded exclusivity on smartphones, on other platforms with respect to its search function, excluding others. Uh, the FTC case against Facebook, the New York case against Facebook, uh, focus on the acquisition and maintenance of monopoly power by means of merger. Uh, Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp and Instagram being singular examples. Uh, the DC government case against Amazon is fascinating. That's Carl Racine. He's the attorney general for the District of Columbia. He also is a candidate to become the new chair of the Federal Trade Commission. And were he to take that job, he would bring an aggressive, powerfully pro enforcement approach to the application of the FTC's power. This is an indication of how enforcement is not just centered in the federal agencies, that state governments in particular and the district in recent years have become much more influential players in the antitrust enforcement area, not co-equal to the federal enforcement agencies, but what's going on in the states, not just the new case in the district, but the state of Texas case against Google, which is going to be prosecuted in a district court in Texas, probably before a jury, is going to be a fascinating additional path through which uh, Google's behavior will be scrutinized. The DC case is going to be litigated by Michael Hausfeld's law firm. Michael is probably the single most important private plaintiffs practitioner in the United States, not just in competition law, but in a host of other areas. The law firm that bears his name, Hausfeld, has been retained by the District of Columbia to litigate the case. So it will not be a matter of a relatively small attorney general's office of the District of Columbia doing the case. The district will be represented by one of the very best in the plaintiff's bar. I'll put the point more strongly. There's probably not a more accomplished and effective lawyer in the United States than Michael Hausfeld. There are other good ones, but none better. The remedies sought in these cases are significant. The FTC, very specifically in the Facebook cases, we want to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp. Structural relief, divestitures, break them up. Also demands for injunctive relief that would impose strict controls on conduct on both Google and Facebook as well. The DC government and Texas are seeking damages against the tech giants they've sued as well. Uh, collectively, these are deadly serious remedial measures. And especially when you talk about the top line, about major divestitures, or about conduct controls that go into the very heart of the business models of these companies, you have caught their attention. And oh, by the way, how much resource do you think they will commit to defending against these? A lot, which will be a big challenge for the government agencies in bringing these home successfully. Alongside this, uh, we have a remarkable series of legislative measures that we have not seen since the 1970s. You've got to go back over four decades to come up with anything like this. A much higher tempo of congressional hearings focused specifically on tech, but also on pharma, on ag. And the proposed legislative agenda would include much more resource for the federal antitrust agencies, strict controls on mergers by dominant firms, virtually precluding the ability of a firm with, say, more than 50% of its market to buy much of anybody. Strict controls on dominant firm conduct uh, to limit their ability to impose exclusive dealing, to engage in price cuts and low pricing strategies. And last, uh, uh, Jason alluded to this, authority for the Federal Trade Commission to adopt prescriptive rules for platforms, to use rulemaking as a way to specify what platforms may and may not do. And we have state legislation dealing with collateral subjects like data protection that's the new that's the virginia statute the new virginia new virginia is not the name of a state it is a new statute by the commonwealth of virginia uh, to impose privacy controls but new york state is considering a retooling of its own antitrust statute that would broaden dramatically its focus and application we have not seen this kind of interest in legislative change again in 40 plus years. 
question mark that we'll talk a bit about more. What, if any of this agenda is going to make its way into the US code? My guess is there'll be a consensus to give the agencies more resources. That'll happen first. That will be some mixture of initiative from Senator Klobuchar in the Senate, uh, Chairman Cicilline in the House. Beyond that, it gets a lot trickier. Congressman Cicilline uh, has been an enormously important force. That is, the forces for a basic transformation of the system now have a powerful ally in the House and have. And the woman to his right, over his shoulder there is Lena Khan. More about her in a moment. She's a nominee to be a member of the Federal Trade Commission and will likely be confirmed within a month or so. Both share a vision of transformation. They are neo-Brandeisian, to use Jason's terms. And they regard those people in the center of the debate that Jason mentioned, the progressives, as being hopelessly centrist, far too timid, and not worthy of being followed in shaping the program for the future. An example of the influence they've had is the hearing in late June of last year that brought together these folks to testify. First time they ever sat together to do this. Uh, this is a resource you know is available to you. I'd watch that hearing on the House Judiciary Committee website. Look at it. Three hours, basically, but it's pretty good theater. And instead of a scatterbrained array of questions that they easily swatted aside, the committee was pretty well prepared, thanks to Lena, and they bore down with great effectiveness on the individual speakers. There was a pleasant introduction and then the House committee got down to business right away. That is Cicilline's opening question to Mr. Pinchai. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Why are you stealing? Uh, you could not quite see the internal thought balloon, but if you look carefully at Mr. Pinchai there, you look at a deer staring at the headlights, don't you? That put him on the back foot right away. Why are you stealing? There was nobody from the Republicans to the Democrats that offered the warm embrace of happiness and respect that all of these people enjoyed only 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when they came to Washington, they were rock stars. How did they go to be pariahs in less than a decade? Part of what they did at the hearing was to put this email in front of Zuckerberg. This is his email at the time of the Facebook acquisition, acquisition of, 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 of Instagram, where the CFO of the company, that's Eversman had written and said, why do we want to spend a half billion dollars or more to buy this scrawny little company that has a nice idea? And in the highlighted passage, you have the CEO saying, because if we wait, they could eat us alive. That's why. They have a nice idea we can fold into our system. But if we wait and they get big, we will spend a fortune having to fight them off. Much better to buy them than to have to compete with them. And despite that, the FTC let that one go through. But this is the focus challenge that took place in those hearings, and there have been more like it. Congress, in other words, is mobilizing resources to collect documents and go right to the heart of the way these companies operate. And there'll be more of that. So I recommend going back and looking at that hearing. It's a great primer for what's probably going to come. And the rest of the world is in on this. I'm going to talk mo mainly about the United States. But today, if you look around the world, there are over 130 jurisdictions that have competition laws. That's 100 more than 30 years ago, when the Berlin, just when the Berlin Wall came down. And the US is no longer the capital of antitrust enforcement. That's Brussels in the European Commission. They have led the assault on tech. The new cases that I mentioned are a significant addition to that framework. And there have been numerous lawsuits and inquiries around the world on tech. Australia, India, South Korea, Japan, China, others. And as Jason mentioned, the new technology for regulation is proposed to be formal regulatory mechanisms that set rules in advance. That's the Digital Markets Act in the European Union. That's the Digital Markets Unit in the United Kingdom. 
And one of Chairman Cicilline's proposals is to create a replica of these mechanisms for the United States, not simply to bring antitrust cases, but to establish a new regulatory framework. When's the last time this happened? You go back to the late 60s and through the 70s. The Department of Justice brought lawsuits to break up AT&T and IBM. They succeeded in AT&T. They dismissed their case against IBM after 12 years of litigation. The FTC brought lawsuits to break up Xerox, the four leading breakfast cereal manufacturers, and the eight leading US petroleum refiners. Succeeded in Xerox. The other cases were dismissed. And Congress adopted a variety of legislative measures that greatly enhanced the US framework, especially what's called the Hart Scott Rodino Antitrust Act that created the modern mechanism for merger review, which requires deals over a certain size to be notified in advance to the government agencies. And their consummation is suspended until the government gets a finite period of time to collect information and to review the transactions. So we have not seen this kind of activity since the 70s, but as I'll mention a bit later on, we ought to study that period to look at how hard it is to accomplish the big case and the big legislative reforms. I wanna give you a view of the schools of thought in this policy debate and how they are shaping the way in which Washington is thinking about the way ahead. Jason laid out the basic outlines of this. I wanna tell you more about that. I wanna tell you where the demands for a basic transformation of the system are coming from, what that agenda is, and how far they've gotten to date, what impact they've had. Uh, what is essentially an insurgent movement, taking on what they referred to derisively as the Washington Antitrust Establishment and taking it on with a great deal of success and whether or not that vision is going to endure. Will it lead to lasting policy results? I'm giving you my views only. I'm a member of the board of the Competition and Markets Authority in the United Kingdom. I'm not speaking for them, but here's the further caveat. I represent everything that the transformationalist advocates say is wrong about antitrust policy. I was at the FTC during the very heart of the period when they said the antitrust system went wrong by not doing enough. Too timid, too confident in market processes. So if I were to invite my acquaintances from the transformationalist side of things, they'd say, don't listen to this guy. I'm going to do my best to give you an assessment on their own terms of what they're doing. But keep in mind, in a sense, I have a horse in this race and I'm not naturally inclined to think that a big part of my life was a waste of time. Uh, I recognize maybe it was, but I don't like to believe that. So that in part colors my views about what's happened, why it happened and where we go from here. Just a warning label on the bottle. Here are two of the catalysts I'll be talking about a lot. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's Barry Lynn. Barry Lynn is the head of the Open Markets Institute. And Barry, more than anybody else for the past 20 years, has been laying the groundwork for the insurgents. And on the right again is Lena Khan. Uh, in, 19, in, in 2017, she was a law student and published a law school law review note on Amazon it has become the most important student article on antitrust ever authored going back to 1890. And she's gone from 2017 being a recent Yale Law School graduate to being nearly a member of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, where they stop working for Chairman Cicilline to frame his hearings. Now, Lena did not go directly to law school. She was a journalist and an investigative reporter for several years after finishing college. And that gave her, I would say, a great factual basis, an empirical orientation that means that she did research, not just on technical details, but she, like Barry, studied individual industries with a great deal of care. It has made her formidable and Barry. Three schools of thought again. I, I'm gonna use different labels for these people. I'm gonna call the relatively conservative group, the traditionalists. And basically their vision is leave it alone. It's working pretty well. The expansionists whom Jason also referred to as progressives. 
I hesitate on progressives because it's an allusion to the progressive movement at the early part of the 20th century of the United States. And if we go back to those progressives and said, what do you think about antitrust? Half of them would have said, it's wonderful, can't have enough. The other half would have said, it's crazy. It's a stupid, meaningless distraction. And what we need is comprehensive public utility style regulation and corporate chartering, because that will solve the problem. Antitrust is a Band-Aid on a fundamental pathology, we have a better solution. So if you brought the progressives follow forward and said, what do you think about more antitrust enforcement? They said, ah, we still haven't gotten it. So I prefer expansionists. Uh, Neo-Brandeisians, I don't like this label either because Brandeis was such an ambiguous figure in many respects. Kind of like competition, but not always. So I'm trying to describe functionally what they really want to do, which is a transformation not an amendment, not an adjustment, change it in what one commentator calls root and branch reconstruction. A bit about the traditionalists. Uh, they say, yes, the, the chief focus should be on the consumer, better prices, better quality, greater innovation. But who are we rooting for in antitrust cases? It is consumers, first and foremost. Focus on that. It means that we don't care about the disappearance of individual firms as long as consumers are not worse off. And they would say in the ordinary antitrust case, if you cannot tie your misery to behavior that also injures consumers, we don't care. Your disappearance is irrelevant unless it has a direct impact on the well being of consumers. That means that. The disappearance of firms, even if they're crushed by bigger firms, is irrelevant. You shrug and say that's a that may be a social shame, but it has nothing to do with antitrust. It emphatically rejects an expansion to the framework of goals to encompass other interests. Workers, footnote. Yes, you take into account worker concerns if they are the target of an employer cartel to suppress wages. That's the no poaching scenario Jason mentioned before. Josh Wright, a uh, uh, co-author of mine at the Scalia Law School at George Mason, probably is the best, most visible exponent uh, of this point of view. Uh, what about the expansionists? Uh, most of these folks are Clinton and Obama era antitrust alumni. They were either in the antitrust agencies or they had policymaking roles in the White House. As Jason said, keep the focus on consumers, but a broad view of the consumer interest, price, quality, innovation, monopsony power in the employment context, emphasize modern microeconomic analysis. That is, the argument is if you use economic policy tools the right way, apply economics sensibly, you'll get broader enforcement. And that should involve tougher scrutiny of mergers, dominant firm conduct using existing tools, but also adopt new legislation with the power to establish prescriptive rules of the kind that Jason was referring to. The best, I think, single exposition of their views is a paper put out by one of the left of center think tanks in Washington, the Center for Equitable Growth, Restoring Competition in the United States. Most of the main advocates for this point of view put their name on that document as co-authors. Back to the transformationalists. Here are two friends again, Barry and Lena. Uh, both more than anyone else have shaped the view that we need to rethink the system fundamentally and change its orientation. What's their program? First, consumer welfare is far too narrow a focal point. Everything Jason told you about why competition law should not be concerned with workers, with democracy, with small business, they would say, that's rubbish. That's the problem right there. And by the way, for my own views, I'm in about the same place Jason is about this, but they would say to me, you don't get it because this is what Congress wanted. They wanted a broader view called citizen welfare and they were willing to give up efficiencies to make people pay a few pennies more for the sake of a more egalitarian business environment because it was good for democracy. How do you get there? You strictly control mergers. And you go after dominant firms using existing enforcement tools. So do much more with what you have, but necessarily you bolster the legislative framework 
to strengthen existing controls, create new regulatory power, and you very specifically go after all these concentrated sectors and you have at them, you deconcentrate them. And if the question becomes, well, how do you accomplish all these objectives on the top line? Their fervent belief is if you achieve broad-based deconcentration, you will get there. That maintaining a much larger number of smaller firms does not come at a big sacrifice in efficiency, and it certainly improves the accomplishment of these other ends. Fascinatingly, the House Judiciary Committee has said, that's the right vision. That's the report for the subcommittee for which Lena was the principal driving force. The report issued in October, 2020 was initially issued as a majority staff report, but the Judiciary Committee as a whole voted in a party line vote to endorse this view. And notice the language, Congress should restate the original intent and broad goals of the antitrust laws by clarifying that they are designed to protect not just consumers, but also workers, entrepreneurs, independent businesses, open markets, a fair economy, not necessarily an efficient economy, a fair economy and democratic ideals. In the views of the transformationalists, if you are not willing to pledge a wholehearted commitment to that aim, set of aims of the antitrust laws, you have no business having a serious leadership position in the antitrust system. And if you align that with Jason's six observations about the antitrust system, notice how that clashes violently with his six prescription that antitrust shouldn't do other things. They would say, that's what's wrong. That is the timid view of the past. That's what we want to reject. And it is fascinating that the House Judiciary Committee has said, yeah, the broader vision is right. Who are the bad guys in their story? Well, that's one, that's Bob Bork. He is seen as having established the consumer welfare standard. He's the exemplar of the Chicago school and a narrower conception of antitrust law. It is a required compulsory figure of every article or book written that espouses a new view that you have a chapter or a section that attacks him and says in blunt terms, he's the bad guy. Uh, Rania Faruhar, who's the columnist for the Financial Times in her book uh, about big tech says, the reason that antitrust went wrong is this guy, as though he did it himself. Well, does public policy ever move quite that way? But he is the bad guy in part because he provides in the spirit of a James Bond thriller, a real bad guy. Uh, can you think of any James Bond movie you've watched and you needn't have spent your lives watching them, but the bad guy is never a sympathetic figure. He's really a bad guy, ruthless and bad. Not just wrong, but a bit demented as well. But here's the other bad guy almost as bad, in some ways worse, it's Barack Obama. It's not the godforsaken Republicans like me. I mean, what would you expect from them? You know, from the minute they show up that they're useless. But here was the guy who had the audacity to hope and promise so much. But what happened? He promised a lot, but delivered very little with respect to a deconcentration program. One source you should be familiar with and to study carefully is this paper, American Economic Liberties Project, The Courage to Learn. Now that's a very modest title, isn't it? The Courage to Learn, a retrospective on antitrust and competition policy during the Obama administration and a framework for new structuralist approach. It's 180 plus pages of venom aimed at the guy on the previous page and all of his enforcement officials. What did they do wrong? It was a big tech revolving door. I'm reciting their views in an understated way that just let Google run through the White House as though there were no barriers to getting in the building. One after another in key policymaking provisions that the Obama White House just went in the tank for big tech right away. And the antitrust agencies, well, no surprise, DOJ didn't bring any significant cases against dominant firms in eight years. And the FTC walked away from suing Google in 2012. 
the polite explanation that the transformationalists give is that the FTC just choked. It had the shot and it wouldn't take it. The other is that it was captured. It was captured by Google. And as a result, they didn't act. And the FTC lets Facebook buy Instagram and WhatsApp without a scratch, despite having documents of the kind that I showed you before. So the transformationalists say, you promised a different world and you didn't deliver. And what's the consequence? Well, to fix it, we need courageous enforcement officials who are not tainted. And when you look at their manifestos, it means no Obama alumni. If you were at the FTC or DOJ before during this period, you are inherently unsuited to do this job. No private practitioners who work for big tech or have big corporate defense backgrounds. And with the courageous untainted enforcers, you're gonna expand the enforcement focus dramatically. And if they say, oh, doctrine's tough, we're gonna to lose cases, tough, go do it. At least try. And if you lose them all, that'll just show that Congress has to do its job and change the law to restate its egalitarian aims. Uh, no more of this consumer welfare rubbish, citizen welfare, broad array of interests that affect citizens. Have the law specifically excise judicial precedents we don't want. Tell the courts, it's a different set of rules now, with bright line prohibitions, without lots of fancy economics that just get in the way of getting a good result in specific cases. What effect have they had? <laughs> They've changed the policy debate dramatically. They changed the center of gravity for policy debate in the United States and abroad. They have deeply influenced the legislative agenda. Cicilline and Buck in the House, Klobuchar and Hawley in the Senate. And the agency cases that I mentioned, state and federal against Amazon, Facebook, Google, it is impossible to imagine that they would have happened in the way they did without this pressure. I can't prove that to you in a rigorous way, but my intuition, almost to the point of moral certainty is that those cases could not have happened without this pressure. And there's an ongoing debate about whom Biden should appoint to lead the DOJ and each division and the FTC. Those are open questions now. You may have noticed on the calendar, we're coming up on Memorial Day. What follows Memorial Day? That would be June. What is June? It's the beginning of the summer. It's nearly the summer and the White House has yet to appoint the head of the antitrust division at the Department of Justice or the permanent chair of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, does President Biden have other things to take care of? Oh yeah. Is antitrust the most important thing he has to do? As much as I like it, I would not assert that it's even in the top 10. But this is the sort of thing you could have resolved by having other people tee it up for you to do it. At DOJ, there's a huge debate going on now, inspired by the transformationalists. Should it be Jonathan Sallet, who is an Obama alum from the Federal Communications Commission and the Department of Justice, and is now advising Colorado in their case? Or should it be Jonathan Cantor? private law firm background, but much more on behalf of complainants against big tech, not exclusively. The transformationalists want Cantor, and they have succeeded in knocking out a host of other candidates who had ties of the kind that I described before. And I would say the delay in getting an answer here is because of that, because of that influence. The FTC, Rebecca Kelly Slaughter, appointed by Trump, but she's a Democrat, She's the acting chairwoman. Uh, acting is one of the ugliest words in the lexicon of public administration. What does acting mean? Temporary, transient, space holder, not to be taken seriously. If you are acting, the question in your mind is just give me the damn job. When are you going to do it? Well, Biden hasn't done it yet. Is it because he wants to make Carl Racine the chair and tell Acting Chairwoman Slaughter, thank you for your service. You've just been downgraded. You are now a mere commissioner again. Is that the plan? Do they have another job in mind? Lena Khan's going to be there soon, but there will still be a vacancy. And we don't have clarity on this, but this delay in establishing the configuration of positions would not be happening were it not for this debate. My view is that Becca Slaughter's views are very much aligned with Lena Khan's. 
She was quoted in the Wall Street Journal at the very beginning of the week of seeing, I, I'm aware of no differences between my views and Lena's. Wow. That would mean you have two transformationalist votes. If you brought in Racine and Slaughter stayed, that would be three. You suddenly have a coalition at the FTC willing to do bold things on a scale not seen since the 1970s. Tim Wu, I should mention, who is part of the transformationalist group, is in the White House now. National Economic Council, special assistant to the president for technology and competition policy. We don't know how directly connected to the drivetrain of decision making Tim is. We don't know. Nice title, nice place to be, but are you disconnected from real decisions? Looks good, but isn't effective, we don't know. But it is interesting that he's there because he is a voice for breaking them up and subjecting them to much more powerful regulatory controls. You could not have predicted this was going to happen 18 months ago. It has. How did it happen? Well, the status quo establishment was very complacent and they have overwhelmed them. Complacent and not reflecting on how the underlying conditions favoring basic reform had been created. And they grabbed the opportunity that was created by the global financial crisis and COVID and the way in which COVID shed an awkward light on the quality and resilience of supply chains. They have generated an avalanche of new publications by my count, I have them here on my desk. I'd show them one at a time, but we wouldn't be done until midnight. All the books that have been written since January of 2019 that espouses this view. And interestingly, if you're a student of how policy has changed, they decided to bypass the Washington establishment and to bypass existing institutions and create an entirely new community. They've relied heavily on new publication venues. What are some of their best? American Prospect, The Intercept, Substack. Not the traditional conduits, they've got their own now. And they're fairly emphatic and they're broadly read. Social media. If you were studying in a Kennedy School way, a textbook model for how to advocate policy, you would study what they've done. They brilliantly use Twitter Footnote, I don't tweet. I, I regard Twitter in the way that I would an automobile crash driving along the highway. Oh dear, how grotesque. Oh, how interesting. Uh, so I read the Twitter lines. I don't do it because it depresses me so much, but I realize that this is the way you mobilize. And they mobilize as a group immediately and powerfully for their allies and they attack in a very harsh way their adversaries. They go right for the throat in a short period of time. They have created new academic and professional networks. Basically what they did was to envelop the existing establishment and the establishment I think still doesn't know what happened to them. This is an example in a way of what John Boyd uh, uh, created by way of what we call an OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide and act and its power comes from speed, identifying your opponent's weaknesses like complacency, using new tools and hammering them so fast, so quickly that they can't quite figure out what's happened. They work very hard. They've been extremely productive. They have a good strategic vision and tactical awareness. They got Lena onto the House Judiciary Antitrust Subcommittee staff and Lena guided those hearings. She wrote the report. And now you have the House Judiciary Committee with their name on it, with their vision. And their approach is truly take no prisoners. And this is part of what surprised their opponents. They name names. They have called out all of the Obama alumni and they hammer them. And they say they weren't only inept because part of the strategy is it's not just ineptitude, it's what they call their favorite word, corruption. Bad policy from bad people. That is to make the case for change, you completely discredit what was there before. You burn it down and you so discredit the architects of the previous regime that you never listen to them again. And this is a major theme of all the tweets. If you wanna read the Twitter thread of the main exponent of this part of you, it's Matt Stoller. Matt's on the staff of the American Economic Liberties Program. He's the guy to follow. Uh, Matt embodies, embodies the approach. 
which has been very effective. Okay, last collection of thoughts. Is it gonna work? Is it gonna last? As I've suggested, they've already changed the conversation dramatically. You know, their key assumptions are, you don't wanna look at the, at, the, at the last 40 years. It's a wasteland, it's a disaster, nothing to learn there. Um, they have a highly stylized view about why antitrust collapsed. It's bork, 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 but not so much attention to why guys like Ralph Nader, who used the term consumer welfare well before Bork did, uh, their view is that the Democratic Party, to use one of Matt's articles, sold its soul in the 70s. High finance, big monopoly capital coalesced with the Democratic Party, and the Democratic Party says, we'll leave big firms alone as long as you keep giving us money to get reelected. And again, what do you need to change it? You need a new generation of enforcers and you gotta give the agencies more power and more resources, but only if you put that in the hands of the right enforcers. Uh, um, what's the blind side? Implementation, that's the hard part. Uh, big reform movements tend to underestimate how hard it is to do. And again, I mentioned my perspective here. Should you listen to this guy at all? I was there during the wasteland period. I worked for a corporate law firm for three years before I started teaching 35 years ago. The transformation advocates would say, this guy has been bitten by the mosquito of inaction so often that he doesn't know that he has malaria. I mean, he's sick and he just doesn't know it. And that Furman guy, him too, uh, both of them, uh, do not have the vision and they can't have it because they're sick. They've grown up in the wrong environment. Why is implementation so important? Uh, one of the most important books on political science ever written 50 years ago. This is Graham Allison. If analysts and operators are in to increase their ability to achieve desired policy outcomes, we have to find ways of thinking harder about the problem of implementation. That is the path between the preferred solution and the performance of government. The big idea versus its accomplishment in practice. Six so we have um, this. yes, please. Yeah, we have uh, one question here. Um, uh, Caitlin, you want to just go ahead and ask that? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just you know, you talked about um, like some big transformationalist approach, but just given the fact that how, the Demo House Democrats on the anti subcommittee, uh, antitrust subcommittee, and House Republicans came out with different re um, reports with Buck sort of advocating a more scalpel like approach. Will there will there be an appetite? Do you think for some something big, like it's a, it's a great question? You have to draw the Venn diagrams, don't you, very carefully, to identify the hatched area that overlaps. Uh, and the big question is, will the coalition of Republicans who hate big tech, for all the reasons you know, uh, be sufficiently sturdy and large enough to join the Democrats in at least? going after big tech first. Will they do that? Will you see legislation that designs specific legislative controls for big dominant firms so that you draw the target around big tech? Will they do that in the House and the Senate? Uh, uh, I think you'll get broad agreement on more resources. Sure, give them more money. But when you go beyond that, is it gonna be a policy of tech first, narrowly uh, tailored around tech? Or are they gonna try to do more? Uh, Cicilline has talked about disassembling the legislative package into discrete pieces that I assume will be served up alongside Klobuchar in the Senate, one at a time, trying to identify that overlapping area in the Venn diagram and to say, let's do this first. But if you did that, the common agreement you'd get with people like Ken Buck saying, I hate these guys, Josh Hawley, I hate these guys. Lots of people saying, I hate these guys, but that these guys is a relatively small set, subset of companies. So do we get tailored legislation that goes after them? And then we debate the larger approach. That's the very uncertain question. If we got that tailored approach, that would be a revolution in antitrust, as well as perhaps a broader consensus that we ought to be looking at a whole host of other issues and interests. But that's a really interesting question. Your judgment as Washington wa watchers is as good as mine about how volatile and uncertain that interesting coalition is. 
But at Lena Khan's hearing, it was fascinating on the Senate Commerce Committee to watch the number of people who said, good for you, to see Ted Cruz tell the nominee, I like your program. I encourage you to carry it forward. I look forward to working with you. You know, is that just going to be focused on the big tech companies? Uh, interesting, interesting question going ahead. So we have, a, we have a question along the same lines from Rebecca. Rebecca, you want to go ahead and ask that? Sure. Um, yeah, you touched on uh, sort of a little bit about us, what I was going to ask, but, you know, given uh, sort of their support, um, you know, a lot of the senators, like you mentioned, were supportive of Lena Khan during the hearing, you know, someone like Josh Hawley, what sort of category would you think to classify him in? Like, would he also fall under a transformationalist, even though so many of his views are, you know, different than Cicilline on some of these Topic. Yeah, I think he does. I think his views are broader. Uh, you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna put this little book up here for you to look at. This is his 200-page uh, book, Tyranny of Big Tech. Um, whether or not you like him or not, it's a book worth reading. Uh, he's in with the transformationalists, uh, but his transformationalist affinity comes directly from big tech. And he doesn't spell out very much how broadly he would apply that perspective to other enterprises. Uh, but, uh, but he writes and talks about how you can't hammer them enough. I mean, before the famous episode in the beginning of January with which you're familiar, the transformationalists regarded him as the hero of the Republican Party. And they tweeted about how this guy is going to carry the banner for us through the Senate. And the suggestion was he could lead a Republican Party transformationalist resurgence that could outflank the Democrats. Uh, you don't read those tweets anymore since January 6th. That's gone away. Uh, but that's, I think, what he thinks. I regard the transformationalist agenda as being somewhat like a moonshot. And it was 60 years ago this week that Jack Kennedy said, we're going to the moon. When he said that, the physics of doing that was pretty straightforward. It involves some fancy math, but the physics of how you do that was pretty straightforward. The engineering was really hard. That's the engineering. None of what we needed to do that was available at that time when he said that. He asked NASA, what do you think? He said, I, I, we spend enough money, we can do it. And he said, can you do it maybe by the end of 1968? What do you think? Uh, so I can have a trophy to take home. They said, uh, we're going to need every day of the decade, as you said. The engineering was really hard. And in public policy, we don't focus on the engineering so much. We talk about physics. The big implementation obstacles. Uh, one, agency capacity, judicial resistance, and unvirtuous political feedback loop. The problem of righteousness and being a, public, a, a policy advocate and uh, sort of a selective history. I mentioned the history because it is the, in the area of military affairs, the, the famous uh, writings of Sun Tzu, millennia ago, he says, if you're gonna wage a campaign, campaign of conflict, and this is conflict, you need to do two things. You have to know yourself and know your adversary and not in a sentimental distorted way, you have to know what they really are and who you really are. So a false sense of history can be poison. And I'm afraid that's a vulnerability here for them. Agency capability. Right now, the agencies do not have the numbers of people or the salaries or experience to run the full-fledged program that the transformationalists want. They just don't have it. As a start, you'd want to pay them at least as much as you do the CFPB, which has a 20% higher salary level. How much do you suppose Amazon Google and Facebook will spend to oppose their government opponents in the class in the in the courtroom right now. What do you think? They will bring the full forces of the evil empire and the private bar economic consultancies to bear. And the rebels will have their work cut out for them. That's not a fair fight right now. What about the courts? Yeah, the courts are the gatekeepers here, as Jason said. The agencies can't do anything that really hurts until the courts say, yes, we agree. And where are the courts? The courts love the consumer welfare focus. The Supreme Court, unless five members of the court, let's say Gorsuch, 
along with, with, with Kavanaugh, Alito, Thomas, Roberts, decide today that they want to open a margarita bar in Key West and quit, the advocates of dramatic aggressive enforcement are going to run into a brick wall. It's not adamantine or inflexible, but that's going to be a hard wall to clear. And is Biden in picking judges going to pay any attention to what Reagan did in his first term, which is to pick academics who had a vision about where the law should go so that they'd move the courts? Will the Biden administration think that the business side of the judicial agenda is important? Oh, the feedback loop. Ah, yeah, here's the feedback loop. Okay, we have legislators say, uh, I'm open to basic reforms, or it's all on the table. Is it going to be taken off the table? Are you open to it, or are you committed, especially when the money starts pouring in? And the advocacy groups come at you. Uh, are the Republicans only in this to scare the daylights out of big tech, or do they really want to change laws, especially in the Senate? And are the Democrats ultimately, who've historically been kind of friendly to big tech, are they going to go for transformation or, oh, let's adjust the edges a bit? Modest reforms, not top level reforms. And when the lobbying really intensifies, what's going to happen? What's the way to bet in Washington? Bold reforms go in, more timid US code changes come out at the other end. Will the durability of antipathy be as great as it is one year, two years from now? And did we mention the clock's ticking? I think we have more elections in November 2022. How much money do you want to bet about what the Senate and the House will look like come January of 2023? And if you know the answer to that with confidence, you shouldn't be doing this for a living. You should be sitting on a beach earning 30% with billions because you can see the future. What's the sequencing going to be a legislative reforms? Softer, easier things like money first and go down the list, including a new regulatory framework. How much of a coalition will there be to do this? But in the meantime, you will be screaming at the agencies at least to do more, which will tend to cause them to block more deals, try to go after more firms. Deal making is going to be tougher in the couple of years ahead. How far does righteousness get you? Is it the motivator that gets you up in the morning or is it a flaw? Well, it's getting the dosage right. There's a problem, I think, in the appointments process if you say that anyone who touched the Obama presidency is radioactive or worked for a big law firm. There are a lot of people you would have knocked out, including, for different reasons, Louis Brandeis and Thurman, or Thurman Arnold, who is the celebrated head of the antitrust division in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, if you insist, on absolute purity, you're going to exclude a lot of people who could advance the program. And if you tell the FTC and DOJ, you have been useless for 40 years, and you happen to be a professional staff member of the agency, do you like being called useless? Do you like being told that your career's work has been of no value at all? They're gonna need these people to do the job. And if you tell them you're idiots and you're the great, great healer who has shown up to fix it, they might not trust you. Okay, Bill, we need to wrap up within five minutes. I just want to check and see, do, uh, are there any yep, questions sure. outstanding we need to work in there? Uh, uh, Bridget. Hi, I was just typing my question uh, in, in the chat. Um, I'm Bridget Bowman with CQ Roll Call. And I was wondering if you could speak to kind of what the public opinion is on when it comes to antitrust, like when we're talking about policymaking, how much public pressure is being put on policymakers to address this? Like do, in other words, like do voters really care about this issue? I've seen polling lately. I don't know who's doing it or how good it is. And some of the polls that have been generated show great public anxiety or nervousness about big tech. How are mm -hmm. these questions being asked? How much do they probe ambivalence? I mean, one of my later slides here is a basic question to systems like competition. And as consumers, you say, yeah, yeah, I like to be able to buy a smartphone with great, great uh, features, even from big companies. Um, as a worker, do you like competition? Not a damn bit. Uh, I, want, I, want a, I want a stable long-term job with good wages. As residents, uh, I don't like competition if it knocks out the local enterprise that I depend on. 
you see a lot of ambivalence about how citizens regard the process of economic change and upheaval that tends to generate big changes in the economic system. Uh, but there are polling results of the last six months, and maybe it's a reflection of a broader anxiety about COVID uh, that show that the public is anxious about and concerned about monopolies and more receptive to change. And again, is that evanescent? Does that depend on other questions being pitched to them? Very hard for me to tell. Thank you. Okay. And, and, other... and those of you who watch The Hill carefully, it's going to be so fascinating to see how people have been talking about who've been talking about what they're open to and willing to discuss where they stand when you start making up that list under each legislative proposal of the three lists, the three columns. Firm support, firm opposition, undecided. What do those lists look like in the Senate right now for each of these proposals? I suppose more money, sure. Yeah, you're 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 well over 50 there and over 230 in the House. But for the rest, hard to tell. But I emphasize what is so interesting is that this has shaken up the enforcement agencies. And they're being told, you bring the damn cases, do your job. God, but we're going to lose. We don't care. Do it. Get out there, fight and lose. Um, you say, well, but you know, there's Scylla and Charybdis. Where are we going to go? And the point is, in the Odyssey, at least Ulysses, they sailed. They went. They did not sit in the sports bar arguing about the dangers. They sailed. That's how you got the book. That's how you got the conclusion. So sail. Face the danger, even if it swamps your boat. Okay. And the um, people so they're picking so far, they embrace that all the way. So I will, the fellows will get the full, um, full PowerPoint. So I know you had, you had more slides there and lots of good details and history there. We'll make and, sure and, the fellows and, get them. And, and if you'll, Chris, if you'll allow me, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to revise these just to get out a couple of the bugs that I just saw. Uh, if you'll let me send that back to you this afternoon and circulate that version, I'd be grateful. Sure, we'll be happy to do that. So yep. any, any final question from the fellows? Um, Caitlin. Sorry, right, I'm sorry we're going over, but thank you for doing this. I'm just curious, how much do you think sort of Republicans focus on free speech and that's why they don't like competition does or does, does, or does not actually reflect sort of this transformationalist view of, of antitrust? The, uh, the Republicans who want sweeping changes and the Democrats who want sweeping changes want it for different reasons, as you mentioned. Uh, and it is the, you know, if we had to identify what I think is one Republican impulse, and this is in Hawley's book too, uh, the tyranny of big tech. What's the tyranny? You're filtering speech. And you're basically listening to any Democrat, you know, any 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 to the barricades Trotskyite who says anything, you just push that right through as though we're the truth of God and you kick us out. That's what you're doing. Uh, so it is very much a speech filtering argument, but I think you've seen that again and again. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the Democrats, of course, don't accept that vision. They're much more attuned to the distortions in the economic system there than I say the Republicans are. But again, another interesting sidelight, the coalescence of Republicans and Democrats about trade, globalization, global supply change, suspicion, suspicion, suspicion. Um, they converge a lot there with part of the message being we need more domestic sources, more variety of the supply base in the United States. OK, um, any final questions? So we're going to. Um, Jeff, if you can maybe stop the stop the share for us, um, and uh, we are going to need to call this to a close. Uh, Bill, I want to thank you very much. I know there's a lot more to get into, um, and I have uh, taxed uh, taxed the 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 fellows with lots of antitrust today. Probably more antitrust talk than they've had. Um, I hope they got something out of it. And this is a big issue that for any of you in Washington and even, even, even those of you in the States, it'll be something that you need to really pay attention to in coming years. That's what the, the hope of this today's sessions were.